This week, our focus shifts to how we understand death in the past using some famous case studies, uh, specifically the European bog bodies in ancient Egypt, to explore concepts such as ethnoarchaeology, bioarchaeology, identity, agency, and materiality. When it comes to death in the past, archaeologists seek a stronger understanding of daily life through the study of death. Um, according to one of your um, the chapters you're reading this week, we're interested in studying the funeral practices that the living perform for the dead. And we try to do this by avoiding, you know, major stereotypes and just focusing on who these people are and what their material remains can tell us about them. To do so, we use the grave as a unit of analysis. So, for example, the shape and depth of the grave may relate to someone's social status or gender. Uh, the graves themselves might be marked or unmarked. Their shape and size um, can mimic houses, storage pits, or other structures. And they might not actually be dug specifically for the individual place there. For example, in British Iron Age populations, we see whole or partial burials in abandoned grain storage pits or even just sometimes in ditches. So why would a grave be left unmarked? Well, these, uh, these graves are often associated with a disgraceful end because a headstone is a sign of respect or fondness that's erected with the intention of remembering a person. A deliberately unmarked grave may signify disdain and contempt. The underlying assumption is that the person buried is not worthy of commemoration and should be completely ignored and forgotten. Unmarked graves have long been used to bury executed criminals as an added degree of disgrace. Many 18th and 19th century prisons and mental asylums used numbered but otherwise featureless markers in their cemeteries, which allowed for record-keeping and visitations while also minimizing shame. Another example are the chulpas in Inca Peru that you see here. They measure about 12 meters or 39 feet um, high. They're made of masonry, although sometimes we see some adobe bricks used as well. And these are what might appear to be, you know, granary sort of features, storage features for food, but they're actually considered to be funerary towers that are constructed for a noble person or family. The corpse itself is placed in the fetal position with some of their belongings inside of the tower. The only openings of these structures face the rising sun in the east. Another example from the region of, wor of the world where I work, down in northwest Mexico, are what we call shaft tomb, shaft tombs. So as you can see over here on the left, it's actually located below the remains of a house. There's a long shaft that leads down into these sort of burial chambers. Um, and then this is what it looks like as sort of an aerial shot from above. And this is the region of the world that we're talking about. So you can see the red dots. Well, actually, sorry, the green dots are where we found these types of burials. In terms of what the burials themselves look like, we see the bodies laid out in a, you know, uh, straight position, and we see many different types of grave goods or offerings left with it with them, as well as the adornment that they were wearing at the time of burial. Um, in this particular case study, we see Lapa. It's actually we've found through DNA studies and genetic sorts of markers that this is a a lineage, a particular family that's buried as if bodies were kind of added over time into this same structure, which is quite interesting. So what is a mortuary context? Well, we've been talking about examples of this all along, but when it comes to, you know, an archaeological context in particular, we have inhumation, which is the deposition of a corpse beneath the ground, so the actual interment of an individual. Um, this is a provisional resting place, for someone, and it's very much a carefully thought out act. There's a lot of time and planning that goes into these sorts of burials. The remains of the, what's left behind then are partial to full skeletons, as well as any funerary goods left behind. Grave orientation, um, the orientation of, its, of a grave's occupants and any structures can also be quite significant. Um, if we think about the orientation of graves when it comes to world religions, um, it can be quite significant. Muslim burials uh, are aligned so that the body faces towards Mecca. For med medieval Jewish burials, we see arrangements south to north with their heads to the south or west to east. 
and for Christian burials, they're typically laid west to east with heads to the west. When it comes to the body arrangement, the body can be arranged in many different positions, on its side, face down, sitting up, standing, legs flex, fetal position, etc. And the body arrangement can be dictated by cultural thinking about death. So if they're meant to rise up and stand on their own two legs in the future, maybe they're in more of a standing or sitting position. Slight differences in the arrangement of bodies throughout a cemetery can actually help to reveal different social groups based on burial practices and beliefs. Um, specific sorts of dramatic poses may actually suggest that death occurred immediately prior to burial. And overall, body arrangement can be highly variable, so even though there might be a trend that we can pick up on with more observations, um, there are always going to be some deviations from the norm. The other type of mortuary contexts that archaeologists deal with are cremation burials, and as we know, this is the practice of burning a corpse. Typically, only fragments of burnt bone are discoverable if the body is buried. So if a body is burned and then just sort of scattered all around, it's very unlikely we're going to find that. The site of the fire itself is also quite difficult to find, but is possible, like for example, if it's the same location used over and over again. Cremated bone typically yields more less information than unburnt bone in terms of age, height, sex, health, inter injuries, or pathology that led to death, um, but it can be more likely to preserve than unburnt bone in soil, especially in soil that's highly acidic. Complicating matters further, cremated bone can contain charcoal, carbonized plant remains, residues of pyre goods, and even animal bones, all of which can um, create to a bit of a confusing mess until you really take the time to parse out all the information that the, the burial is providing you. The image we're seeing here is actually from the site where I did my dissertation work, the site of La Quemada, located in Zacatecas, Mexico. And it's an important one to consider when it comes to the use of both primary and secondary burials. So a primary burial is one that's the, it's, it's one where we're seeing the initial deposition or burial of someone. This is very much associated with the severance of physical contact with the family and the community. Whereas a secondary burial is any additional movement of or ceremony for the deceased individual. And this is associated with altering the spiritual condition of the, of the deceased. So at the site of La Quemada, we have examples of some actual uh, tomb, formal tombs where, where burials are placed. But there's actually a structure here on the west side of this sort of open platform where we see the sort of hanging bundles of displays, and we've interpreted these as a form of ancestor veneration or an ancient ossuary, where you can see that people were touching the bones a lot over time, leaving residue and sort of um, making them, having this shiny sort of appearance. So the handling of bones, clearly venerating and you know dealing with them on a more regular basis. Grave goods are very important for our purposes in terms of figuring out who these people were within their own cultures or societies. The items that are left within a burial, they might be the possessions of the dead, or they're simply just gifts from the mourners who are attending their burial. In some cases, these are attempts to equip the dead for the afterlife, or might even be ways of trying to prevent them from, from returning. You know, we don't want these spirits hanging around the community too long. So it goes with a lot of those taboos and the sort of pollution associated with burials in some cultures. For the, in the most case, though, um, common grave goods tend to be clothing or adornment, containers for all sorts of um, liquids or other foodstuffs, and then the remains of food and drink itself. When it comes to clothing and adornment, the preservation is not usually very good. depends on the conditions of the burial and the soil that it's placed in. Um, the people in the burial, might be they may dress in clothes that were actually never worn in real life. You can imagine, you know, someone nowadays who is buried in a fancy suit but never really wore one on a regular basis. Um, in that case, you know, you're seeing an example of them wearing their best or, you know, 
best outfit possible or something that won't be missed as much by the mourners who are living on without them. There are obviously cases in which there are specific sorts of apparel that's made for the dead, so burial shrouds as an example. But ultimately, the dressing of the dead is done by the living, and it's usually an intentional statement. So it's um, it's the, the mourner's reading or representation of the dead person's former self-representation self through dress. So however we want that person to be remembered is the last sort of image that we want people to see of them. When it comes to clothing and adornment, there's other aspects other than clothing, of course. There are, you know, body modifications, tattooing, painting, or scarification that can be seen on the body. Any sort of ornamentation that they're wearing, a lip plug or earrings, would still be preserved depending on the material they're made of. Their hairstyle, which we do see evidence of hair in some cases. When it comes down to it, though, archaeologists need to be wary of how we separate the material culture on the body, so such as clothes, from the material culture of the body, so the posture or body modification of the individual. And in addition, separating that from the material culture off the body, so the sorts of weapons, furniture, or other items that they're buried with. It can be very easy to impose our own categories um, and divide things up, like clothing, furniture, weapons, and jewelry, when in reality, they may have been worn, used, deposited for very different reasons. Food and drink um, marks the differential status of living in the dead. So different offerings are made for the dead person in the grave, but also the consumption of different foods at the funeral itself. The types of food that we find in burials helps to mark someone's identity. So there are various types of food that can be deposited along different types of people. It's a, food is also a marker of status, so the sacrifice of a large or rare game animal could indicate that this is a very important person. Uh, and one thing to really keep in mind is you know, the containers themselves, the metal, glass, or ceramic containers that we find may have been significant in and of themselves, but very often it was whatever they were containing, they were holding for that person to move on with into the next life that was more important. So how do we know these sorts of things? Well, archaeology is uh, a science that pulls from a lot of different fields and subdisciplines. Um, zooarchaeology is the study of animal bone remains, so that actually helps us to figure out what sort of creatures were maybe sacrificed and left in the burial. Um, palynology, which is the pollen analysis. We take what are called flotation samples to get all these sort of burnt remains, plant chars, charred plant remains that would float to the surface. Look at those under a very powerful microscope and we can figure out what type of plants were left behind. And lastly, and probably most importantly, is the practice of what we call ethnoarchaeology. And that is the ethnographic study of people for archaeological reasons, which is usually done through the study of material remains. What this does is it relies on what we call ethnographic analogy, or the application of observed behavior to non-observed behavior. So, obviously, the practices of people who have been long dead, we can't physically see what they did to create the sort of patterns we see in the material record. Excuse me. But what we can do is go, live, go and study among living groups nowadays or in the recent past, observe them engaging in different sorts of behaviors, and then look to see what sort of material remains are left behind from those activities. And that's what allows us to draw these sorts of analogies between cultures uh, that, we, that we see as having a shared environment, interactions, or ancestry with the cultures we're studying in the past. A specific example of this is what's called the direct historical approach, and in this case it draws on contemporary cultures that are close genetically or spatially related to an archaeological culture. So for example, where I work, there are indigenous groups that we see as descendant communities from the archaeological cultures that would have occupied this region in the past, and we can go and observe behaviors among them to help us understand and interpret the material remains. So a certain type of artifact that we would see within a funeral or mortuary context 
artifacts that are associated with this sort of separation and transition, you know, that second phase that Van Gennep identifies in his rites of passage. So these are artifacts that serve to prevent an individual from remaining in the world of the living or ensure that they have a good send-off. Nowadays, here in Western cultures, we see cut flowers for funeral ceremonies having great significance. Um, we have started, you know, in the past with trying to cover up the smell of a decaying body. There's also metaphorical sorts of interpretations of, you know, the cut flower doesn't live. It's going to just kind of fade quickly if it's not taken care of. So the symbolization that's associated with that. We sometimes place the possessions of a person on or in the grave as a gift or a tribute. Dogs in parts of pre-Hispanic Mexico are a particular example of this. Overall, these are very intentional acts. Um, the people select artifacts for particular reasons because of the meanings that are associated with them within that culture or society. So the cemetery organization, which is something you're going to get into in homework two, is also important. There are some common cemetery patterns that we see. Um, in this way, we it's built off this principle of horizontal stratigraphy, so moving out in space along the same plane, which tells us that the increasing size of a cemetery over time means that different parts of the cemetery will date to different times. So a few cemeteries grow randomly, um, and so in this case there are usually organizing principles that we can recognize and help us to interpret what we're seeing. There's four types of general patterns that we see. <clears throat> the first being linear cemeteries that often develop from a particular focal point, so the founder's grave or some sort of physical barrier, and that's what we're seeing in the upper left corner here. Um, a second example is concentric or hierarchical patterns, which grow out from and respect a central burial. So in this case, we might see you know, these sort of clustered, segmented sort of areas that form around areas of focus. Segmented burials are divided into discrete um, clusters, sections or clusters but there are sometimes these sort of open spaces between them. That's actually, sorry, what we're seeing in this example up here. This is more of a concentric or hierarchical burial that's focused on that central focal point. And then the last one are segmented, row segmented sorts of burial patterns. And we're seeing two examples of that here. It's more head to toe. You're seeing alignments of burials in a linear fashion. Um, or there's also you know, their placement side by side. Overall, though, cemeteries can provide evidence about kinship, gender, and social status. Many times we need to use different forms of multivariate statistics, so cluster analyses are required to help us get at these sort of finer grain results or details that we're able to interpret. The barriers themselves can be segregated by status, family, health, uh, deviancy or the ethnicity of the people buried there. What's important to keep in mind though is that most ancient funerary rites are archaeologically invisible. Um, we often focus on the most elaborate ones because of their potential for learning and they're what we might call you know the, the lowest hanging fruit. They're most obvious sorts of examples but when we do that we're often missing huge parts of the picture. And that's something I'm trying to emphasize in this week's activity, which we'll get to. Our knowledge of the past is dictated by burial practices. So if there's no formal rite of burial in some capacity, then we're never going to find those people and their remains in the archaeological record. So that's a really important thing to keep in mind. However, in some cases, we get quite lucky. Um, you think about some of the famous Maya burials, the tomb of Pakal at Palenque, for example, in Chiapas, Mexico, is a very famous example. You've got a very nice pyramid structure built on top of the burial itself. This beautiful sarcophagus um, cover depicts Pakal actually, you know, falling down this tree of life, world tree sort of axis mundi that we've talked about in the past from the land of the living down into the underworld. 
you know, this is a the elite sort of focus, the 1%, whereas maybe we're more interested in looking at what everyday life was like in societies in the past.